Gary Marcus is a scientist, best-selling author, and entrepreneur. He's the founder and CEO of Robust AI and was the founder and CEO of Zerometric Intelligence, a machine learning company acquired by Uber in 2016. He's the author of five books, including The Algebraic Mind, includes The Birth of the Mind, and the New York Times bestseller Guitar Zero, as well as the editor of The Future of the Brain and the Norton Psychology Reader. Gary has published extensively in fields ranging from human and animal behavior to neuroscience, genetics, linguistics, evolutionary psychology and artificial intelligence, often in leading journals such as Science and Nature, and is perhaps the youngest professor emeritus at NYU. His newest book, co-authored with Ernest Davis, Rebooting AI, Building Machines We Can Trust, aims to shake up the field of artificial intelligence. Today, Gary is going to talk about rebooting AI by adding knowledge to deep learning. So, so I'm going to talk today about the kind of artificial general intelligence that I wish we had and contrast it with the artificial intelligence that we have right now. So <clears throat> people sometimes use the phrase AGI to mean general intelligence that could solve any problem, sort of like the Star Trek computer. And you could imagine an AI that would be pretty much smarter than human beings, <clears throat> would be able to read and synthesize the fast-growing medical literature, be able to reason causally, help us make difficult decisions in the real world, um, in novel environments where we haven't been before, in situations where we had partial and incomplete information. We could also imagine an intelligence that was uh, <coughs> bright enough to allow us to guide robots to keep humans out of dangerous situations to care for the elderly and work in hospitals, deliver packages to your door and so forth. We could imagine all that. I'm gonna argue we're not really there yet. And talk a little bit about how we <coughs> might get there. So um, the AI that we actually have mostly plays games, although I'll talk about AlphaFold a little bit later, um, transcribes syllables and vacuums floors. Um, and most of it doesn't do a whole lot more than that. Um, current AI is filled with promise. So people, often say, hey, we're just about to completely replace this profession. So Jeff Hinton, who is one of the founders of Deep Learning, said in 2016, it's just completely obvious that within five years, Deep Learning is gonna be better than radiologists. And then Elon Musk has been telling us for years that he's gonna have self-driving cars. Um, and you know there are certainly demos of that available, but not things that you could actually trust yet. Delivery often falls short. Um, Losing the slides here. Okay, good. Um, so the reality is there are hundreds of deep learning startups trying to work on radiology, but no actual radiologists have been replaced. And in fact, we don't have enough radiologists. And I have a headline here from April 2019. It's been even worse um, during the COVID era. And uh, Tesla has its smart summon feature that it introduced a year ago, but sometimes it can barely make it across the street. Teslas have been known to drive <coughs> into stop cars. Two Teslas have driven underneath semi-trails, killing their drivers. So there's actually a lot of problems. And it's important to realize that when people talk about deep learning, um, <coughs> deep just means the number of layers in a neural network. It doesn't mean deep understanding. So if I train a deep learning system on a bunch of pictures of elephants, it might recognize another elephant. So if I give it all the pictures on the top row, it might recognize some in the bottom row. But they're also very easy to fool these systems. So an example here, there's a little delay here, um, is if I show a deep learning system a picture of an elephant that is silhouetted, deep learning system may actually call that elephant a person. So there's no deep understanding of the fact that an elephant is a creature with a trunk, nor of what a silhouette does to lighting. There's just really recognition of things like texture. So it's actually very superficial, despite its um, very uh, seductive name. And there are lots of other examples of that. So on the left, a deep learning system is looking at a school bus that's overturned, and it's saying with 92% confidence that that is actually a snowplow. And it's not a snowplow. The deep learning system has confused some of the texture of the image, the, um, the model gray and and dark roads and, and the, the white snow, and it's following the texture rather than understanding what a vehicle is. <coughs> the other example at the top shows you an, uh, a baseball, and the deep learning system is recognizing it 
incorrectly as an espresso because it's misled by the foam on top. The one on the bottom is showing a banana next to a kind of psychedelic picture of a toaster. And the deep learning system is overwhelmed by the sticker and thinks that it's seeing a toaster rather than an actual banana. So this stuff is very popular and yet often very flawed. It actually works pretty well for face recognition. So the system is going to be able to tell you the difference between Tiger Woods and a golf ball. And it does that by having a series of so-called neural network layers, which I imagine most people in the crowd have seen by now. Um, and basically what you're doing is a big data analysis that's leading to complex statistical correlations. Kind of works for space recognition, although we know there are some problems there. It really <coughs> doesn't work for things like reasoning and language understanding. So we get things, we get promised things. Sorry, there's a delay here again. Um, we get promised things like Facebook's M, which people may not even remember five years ago, that was supposed to be a very intelligent chatbot. And then three years later, or two years later, I forget, three years later, it just disappeared, never came out. Um, the idea was they would take a lot of big data from people using an intelligent assistant and then pour it into a deep learning system and out would come an assistant that was much more powerful than Siri. It never happened. The thing that most people are talking about nowadays is GPT-2 and GPT-3. Um, I have on the left one of the first bits of hype I saw about it where <coughs> The Economist allegedly ran an interview with GPT-2 and um, the system looked very impressive. So the economist would ask questions like, which technologies are worth watching in 2020? And the system says, I would say it's hard to narrow down the list. It seems very grammatical. But what they didn't tell you is they actually cherry pick the best answers. Um, humans cherry pick the best answers that are produced by the machine. A lot of them are actually incoherent. When I tested the system more systematically, I found things like you tell it, so it works by sentence completion, the stuff in bold here. At, I would tell the computer and then it would proceed. I'd say a water bottle breaks and all the water comes out, leaving roughly, and the system continues six to eight drops of beer. Well, obviously it doesn't understand what a water bottle is. I came up with another example. Um, if you drink hydrochloric acid by the bottle full, you will probably, and the system continues, get sick of it fast if you just try to drink the bottle full. You must either take a long break or drink a lot of water immediately. The system has no idea what's actually going on. It talks fluently because it's basically cutting and pasting at some level, I'm simplifying a little bit, but cutting and pasting text from what a lot of humans have used. So I criticized this system, and this was about, I don't know, eight months ago, and then they produced other versions. Uh, sorry, I'll, one more slide. This, this reminded me of Eliza in 1965 or 66, um, <clears throat> which I hope all of you have seen before, which was the first chatbot, and you would talk to it and say, is something troubling you? And you might say, men are all alike, and then the system Eliza would say, What's the connection, you suppose? And it gave the illusion to human beings, almost like a magic trick, that it understood what was going on. But if you would follow it for a few sentences, you discover that it's not. <coughs> GPT is really the same. So now we have GPT-3, and it has 450 terabytes of input data, which is an astonishing amount. But you still have the same problem. So here's an example. Um, the blue is the response from GPT-3 to something that Ernie Davis and I uh, put to it in, in August. Um, you pour yourself a glass of cranberry juice, but then you absentmindedly poured a teaspoon of grape juice into it. It looks okay, you try sniffing it, but you have a bad cold, you can't smell anything, you're very thirsty. And what does GPT continue with? It says, so you drink it and you're now dead. Now, there's a lot of data on the web to tell you that you can actually combine cranberry juice <coughs> and grape juice. In fact, there's a commercial product called Cran Grape um, from Ocean Spray. This is actually perfectly fine to drink, there's data there, to tell you is there, but the system doesn't actually have a concept of toxicity, of a drink, of pouring, of anything. It's all basically just a big parlor trick. Um, and yet, you still see things like the Times earlier this week extolling how great it is. It's really not that great. Um, the Times ran some stories, and if you, they were generated by it, and some of them are really weird. Like one of them ends, we went out for dinner and drinks and dinner and drinks and dinner and drinks. I won't use up all my time to read the entire thing, but it's clearly not something not working very well. <clears throat> there are always going to be examples like on the left where AIs created by this system, by OpenAI, seem to work very well. So there's an appointment system on the left. And then there are uses of it that are actually deadly. So somebody tried to turn it into a suicide prevention system and we got, hey, I feel very bad, I want to kill myself. And GPT-3 responds, I'm sorry to hear that. Can I, um, I can help you with that. And then the person says, should I kill myself? 
and GPT-3 says, I think you should. Well, obviously, we don't want to trust a system like this in a real-world kind of situation. Um, so I'm reminded of a cover of a uh, cartoonist that I uh, used to really enjoy. Uh, uh, Doonesbury had a book called Still a Few Bugs in the System, and I think that's a fair way to describe what's going on. Oops, okay, I may have a slight problem. Waiting for the, okay. Um, the reality is that deep learning works best in a regime of big data and worse with unusual cases. So if you have a lot of pictures of children playing Frisbee and then you have the system label it, it might tell you that ch there are children playing Frisbee. But if you do something unusual, it's still important, you don't have a lot of data, then deep learning really just doesn't work very well with that kind of system. Um, here's an example kind of picks up from that. Venture capitalist Benedict Evan posted the tweet on the left. He said, this is why we train autonomous cars in San Francisco, because it lets you look at the long tail. So there aren't a lot of cars with stickers on it. But then uh, my friend David Ha fed this into an ImageNet classifier, one of these deep learning systems, and out came Flamingo, Griffin, Photocopier, Shopping Cart, and Coral Fungus. So these systems really just cannot be counted on. And the particular problem is, is really when you have small amounts of data. So the way I would put it is that deep learning is a better ladder, but a better ladder doesn't necessarily get you to the moon. This is what I've been arguing since 2012, and I stand by it. So what, what are we going to do about that? <clears throat> I've recently written a book called Rebooting AI with Ernie Davis, and an article that you can look at for free called The Next Decade in AI. Four Steps Towards Robust Artificial Intelligence. Um, the article is a little bit more technical than the book. The argument is that to get to the next level, we're going to have to move past tabula rasa, which is to say blank slate deep learning, which is the thing that is popular, but it's not really getting the job done. So this doesn't mean that we have to completely toss deep learning and just not use it at all. I'm not arguing that it's not useful, but I think it means that we need to find ways to supplement it. So I tried to be clear about this over and over again. I'm usually um, straw man by, by those who I criticize, they say, well, Marcus is saying we should get rid of deep learning. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, the paper where I first really laid out my critique of deep learning in depth, I said, despite all of the problems I've sketched, I don't think we need to abandon deep learning. Rather, we need to reconceptualize it, not as a universal solvent, but as simply one tool among many. It works very well for perception, and we have to be realistic that it doesn't work as well for common sense, for planning, analogy, language, reasoning, and things like that. In fact, a good thing to realize and to re remind ourselves of is artificial intelligence is actually not one technique, but many. Deep learning is an example of something called machine learning, where we get machines to try to learn things, and there are other uh, approaches to it, like probabilistic learning and genetic algorithms. And then there's a much larger field of artificial intelligence that focuses on, excuse me, focuses on things like planning, reasoning, search, and knowledge representation. And of course, at this conference, people know uh, a fair bit about knowledge representation. Um, <coughs> We have to take deep learning in context. So one of the things I've been arguing for for many, many years is a hybrid approach. So I don't think we can get to AI that we can trust um, and trust in terms of is it safe enough to drive our cars to avoid bias and so forth by using deep learning alone. It's good for some kinds of learning, but it's poor for abstraction. And I don't think classical good old fashioned AI, as people sometimes call it, is going to get us to robust AI either. It's good for abstraction, but poor for learning. So what we're really going to need are hybrid models that bring together the two traditions. Um, some of you may know Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast and slow. Um, oops, again, a slide delay issue. Um, Dan Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast and slow is a really good example of one hybrid model, which is the human mind. The human mind has reflexive systems that work by reflex very quickly, and then deliberative systems that work more slowly, and they work together. Marvin Minsky's book, The Society of Minds, is about how we might actually have hundreds of agents in our head um, that are essentially a large hybrid working together. And uh, Steve Pinker's book, Words and Rules, which is in part about my graduate thesis work, um, is about how one microcosm of human cognition, namely how we form the past tense of verbs, itself looks like a hybrid. The Achilles heel of the traditional neural networks, and some people will follow this and some won't, it's OK. Um, is that they can generalize to examples that are similar to ones they've seen before, but they're very poor at extrapolate, extrapolating beyond those examples. I laid this 
argument out in the book, Al The Algebraic Mind in 2001. And recently, Yashua Benjo, one of the leaders of deep learning, has been making a similar argument. Um, so in, in the illustration here, I'm showing how you could learn a simple function like make the input the same as the output. And a deep learning system will do well on cases that are near the green cases. But if you go to other cases that are different, um, it will fall apart. So a bit of classical AI can actually be very helpful here, which is the machinery of symbol manipulation, where you have things like variables, instances, and bindings and operations over those variables that you'd recognize from grade school algebra. So x is a variable, 3 might be the instance that it has right now, and you're saying x equals 3, and then you can do something like addition over that. You see these in computer languages going back to, for example, Lisp, and in fact, all computer programming languages. And the virtue of variables is you get open-ended generalization. So if I say y equals x plus 3, you can try filling in x is 2 or 3, but you can also put in x is a million or a billion or whatever doesn't matter if it's something that you've seen before, you're free to generalize it. <clears throat> and this in turn makes possible complex structures such as trees and graphs that I know are important at this conference and need to be more important in contemporary artificial intelligence. And part of that is because a lot of what we know about the world is very general. So you know that if you break a bottle that contains a liquid, some of that liquid will, other things being equal, probably escape the bottle. And you can tell that even if you see some new bottle that's shaped like a teddy bear or whether it's holding a liquid you haven't seen before. And pure deep learning systems like GPT are pretty unreliable with knowledge like this. So I typed into GPT-2, if you break a glass bottle of water, what does it say? The water will probably roll. That's not quite really right. Um, if you break a glass bottle that holds toy soldiers, well, you know that the toy soldiers are going to fall out. But GPT says the toy soldiers will probably follow, it, follow you in there, which makes no sense at all. There's no actual concept of a bottle or soldier or anything like that. Again, it's just an illusion that a lot of people have been fooled by, but it's not real. Um, without common sense knowledge, things like robots are a disaster. So you take Roomba, you uh, send it near dog waste that doesn't have any knowledge about what that is, and it ends up spreading it all around like the Jackson Pollock painting. In fact, there's now a word in the English language called a poopocalypse, um, which is from Roombas without the common sense to understand what's going on there. So the argument I would make is that some small but critical part of the knowledge that is um, in, sorry, some small but critical part of our knowledge, of our common sense knowledge, is likely to be innate. And it's not just innate in humans, but probably in AI as, as well. So this is a quote from Elizabeth Spelke, the um, cognitive development researcher at Harvard, who has said, if children are innately endowed with the abilities to perceive objects, persons, sets, and places, then they can use that experience to learn about the properties and behaviors of such entities. And she points out that if you don't start with at least that, you're in real trouble. It's not clear how to even get the process of learning started. And I concur with her. We need to have in our systems <coughs> ways to represent knowledge about space, and time, and causality. So the picture I have in the middle is a cheese grater. We need to have a way of teaching robots what a cheese grater is in which way you would move the cheese with reference to the grater and why that would give you cheese. Uh, gratings as opposed to if you move the cheese in the opposite direction. We really don't have a way to do that. Uh, my colleague Ernie Davis and I have been working on it a little. This is a picture um, from an article that we have about understanding containers and the innate knowledge that you might need in order to uh, represent containers in an AI system. I point out also that hybrid models, although they're not very popular, they're, I think they're becoming more popular, and ones that embed knowledge into deep learning do much better than blank slate. Model. So I'm sure everybody saw yesterday AlphaFold. Well, AlphaFold, you know, it's a, I think it's a probably a great contribution, although there are some questions we could talk about in the discussion period. Um, it actually builds in the notion that a folded protein should be represented as a particular kind of graph that they call um, a spatial graph with residues that are nodes and edges that connect and blah, blah, blah. Um, so deep learning people have mostly for the last 20 years emphasize blank slate systems. They've kind of ridiculed me for saying we need innate knowledge. But when push comes to shove and they want to um, do well on a benchmark like the protein folding thing, they often actually build in uh, knowledge. And in fact, that contrast with the deep learning paper from uh, DeepMind, who did this work just a couple of years ago, where they were saying master and go without human knowledge. Well, they were not able to master proteins without human knowledge. The human knowledge was actually critical. The third thing that I think we need 
and maybe we can go into it a little bit more later in, in discussion, I'll just touch on it briefly now, is we need to have reasoning systems. So deep learning is very good at memorizing things. It's not particularly good at reasoning. Um, the example I've here is drawn from a paper in Forbes by Doug Lennett from his system, the Psych Project. You can go look at it in detail later. But he did the kind of amazing thing of representing in an AI system, not a deep learning system, but a classic GoFi um, system, uh, Romeo and Juliet. Now, there's not everything is satisfying about it. Um, and I'll tell you in a second what's not. But it, it's a proof and concept that you can get an AI system that represents knowledge richly to reason about pretty complicated things, like um, why Ro Romeo, uh, sorry, why Juliet takes the feigned death uh, potion and what she believes Romeo is going to do as a consequence. Um, it's pretty sophisticated stuff, way beyond what deep learning can do. The unsatisfactory thing is in order to get this, there's a lot of hand tinkering, and we really like to be able to build these cognitive models of what's going on. So what are the different things that have happened in a story and so forth? We would like to be able to learn those from text um, with some kind of prior common sense knowledge, and we can't really do that. But it's a proof and concept that if you have a rich model of the world, um, as the psych system does for the Romeo and Juliet system, you can really reason in much more sophisticated ways than other current AI systems can do. So I'll summarize and then I'll take questions. Um, I think COVID-19 is a wake-up call for AI. Uh, um, I think it's a wake-up call um, because for the most part, AI, even though we've been hyping it for the last six or seven years, has not had a huge impact on what we actually have done in the COVID situation. So there's a little bit in contact tracing. Maybe there's some suggestions for vaccines, but the ones that have actually worked have been developed by human scientists who understand the causal nature of biology, not by AI systems at the moment. Um, and so I think it's motivation for us to stop building AI for ad tech and news fades, which is really what most of AI has been used for, um, and start building AI that can really make a difference. I do like the alpha fold as one step in that direction. Um, with better AI, I think computers might be able to read, digest, and synthesize a vast and rapidly growing literature that's too big for individual humans to process um, and suggest ways to optimize um, treatments and vaccines. Computers, if we built them in more sophisticated ways, could also monitor world preparedness in a wide variety of domains where clearly we fell short. And we might have robots that are able to take on some of the risks that human healthcare workers are facing. That's part of what I'm trying to do in my own company, Robust AI. To get to this next level of AI that can operate in trustworthy ways, even in novel environments, we need to work towards building systems with deep understanding and not just deep learning. The best way to get started on that journey is to focus on developing hybrid, knowledge-driven, reasoning-based systems with rich cognitive models. And I thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take questions. Question from uh, Zinia, who asks if you're familiar with uh, Adele, Adele Goldberg's work uh, in linguistic, uh, and, uh, and if there's a place for that in natural language processing. Sure, I, I am familiar with it. Um, I'm not an expert on it, but I'm familiar with it. Uh, I think there's a lot of technical arguments in linguistics about exactly the right framework. Um, and I'm not 100% sold on her framework, but I think the spirit of it is good. Um, what one really wants to do in linguistics is to map between meaning and form. One wants to take, for example, if one's trying to produce a language generation system, an idea that you want to express and force into a linear stream of words. That's what it is to write something or to say something. Or conversely, you want to go the other way around. You want to go from a sentence that you hear to the meaning, and that's going to include both a literal meaning and probably some context around it, including your background knowledge and how you interpret it. And what Adele is trying to do, she's a professor at Princeton, um, is to have some kind of mapping between the meanings of particular constructions in language. So that might be a phrase like, I want to talk about X, and the meaning of what that phrase is. And there are arguments within linguistics about how general you want your knowledge of these kind of linguistic mappings to be. And I might take a slightly different view from her, but I think that generally trying to understand language in terms of these mappings between meaning and form is really critical. And you might wonder why I'm even saying that. But the reality is it's very different from how most people are approaching language processing right now. So GPT-3 does not have any representation of meaning. It just has a representation of form. 
And the way that it works is from form to form. So um, by form, I mean like a string of words in a sentence. So what it does is basically autocomplete. GPT-3 is the best version of autocomplete ever made. So you start a sentence like, I want to talk today about, and then it finds some things in a database, essentially. Um, that's not how it works technically. But it finds things that are close, and it produces things that are close to what you've seen before. In something like the way that autocomplete works, but it's sort of autocomplete on steroids, let's say. We can go into details of it here. Um, it's not mapping a meaning about a person wanting to say something, what is the content of them wanting to say. So it's very weird from a language production perspective. You know, classic language production in computation is, I have this system that wants to tell you something. But GPT-3 doesn't take an input about what you want to express. It just takes part of a sentence and fills it in. So Adele is, I think, much closer to what I think you need to do, which is to understand the relation between ideas that people have and how they want to say them. There are technical you know, quibbles I have um, with a little bit of what, what she does, but I think the spirit is, is the right spirit there. And she's also um, often worked with uh, Ray Jackendoff, who I'm a big fan of, um, a linguist from Brandeis, who I guess is retired now. Great. So uh, thank you, Gary. I'm, I'm skimming through the questions and trying to um, make some kind of common uh, question through through this. I think one one of uh, one of the topics people are we're interested in is um, more into into the technical uh, technical aspects. Maybe how is that integration uh, between deep learning and knowledge graphs happening? Um, maybe how far are we? Uh, and technically, how does it look like? Is it that we can use a knowledge graph and then plug that to a neural network in order to help that neural network to process. Because if we take the AlphaFold example, right, there are there is some human domain knowledge that is put there, but it doesn't look like a knowledge graph in the way we, we talk about it uh, here today, right? We're, we're still far there, from there that. There is a graph there. there. All I can work with so far is the blog, right? There is not a written publication <coughs> about the paper yet, so it's a little hard to know. Um, uh, AlphaGo is also working through a graph, right? So um, the whole suite of alpha systems from DeepMind has some representation of a graph that they are traversing in some way. I don't think there's a general solution yet. So um, AlphaFold is representing a very specific kind of graph that has been tuned. There's some secondhand accounts of this, um, including one by Jeremy Kahn and Fortune, um, and a little bit of hint from the, the um, blog that DeepMind posted. Um, it's a very specific kind of graph that's representing particular structure about the protein, and they're using the deep reinforcement learning system to tra traverse that graph in a very particular kind of way. So it's a domain-specific answer to the question that you're just asking. We don't yet have a really good domain general way to do it. So people are talking a lot about graph neural networks and so forth. Um, and they, they can do some things. They're not very good at abstract knowledge. So they're pretty good at integrating kind of things that are immediately adjacent in the graph. They're not necessarily good at doing the reasoning at the level that psych system is doing, where you can have abstract quantified statements to use the terms from linguistics or philosophy, you know, for all x such that x has this property, the following thing follows. They're not able to do that very well, whereas that's really inherent in how psych is working. So um, psych can reason over things like people are alive between the year that they were born and the year that they died, but not before and after, and then reason about that with respect to inferring a sequence of events. And so if you want to know what Romeo is going to make of the idea that Juliet is dead when she isn't really dead, and how you know Juliet's going to feel if Romeo you know misses the memo, um, you need to be able to reason in a fairly abstract way over the information that's in the graph. If all you need to do is decide is Paris more likely to be a celebrity or a location? You might be able to do that with a less sophisticated level of knowledge, especially if, if the, um, the level of reliability that you require is not that high. So if you're doing it for keyword search and you get 85% of the time which version of Paris people mean, that might be okay. If you're trying to understand a plot of a movie, you really need to understand what's going on. If you're building a robot, you really need to understand the world. It's not good enough to be 70% correct. Same with a driverless car. So, you know, you can statistically approximate a lot of things, but you could imagine that the right solution to driverless cars might actually have some knowledge on a graph that you need to traverse in order to understand, like, okay, what does it mean when somebody has orange cones in front of a hole, right? You might not have that in your database 
explicitly with respect to driving, but you want to infer by a general notion of people use orange cones to indicate things, to indicate safety, you might want to make inferences about that scenario. And nobody has a general way of doing that in the context of deep learning right now. So um, we may need a new invention that simply has not been made yet. We have these specific things like AlphaFold that are like, I have this kind of graph that is this kind of knowledge, and I want to do some relaxation of constraints with respect to that. Um, we don't really have a general form. And you know, part of what I've been arguing for is that that's actually the most important problem right now is to think about how to put together things like graphs and you know which what are the right knowledge representations we don't really know graphs are, are you know a good candidate but we don't know that for sure um, we need something on that kind of spectrum to integrate with learning it may be that the learning the deep learning does is itself just too superficial so there are approaches like inductive logic program that try to work over more richer abstractions that have variables in them and so forth. And I don't know if that's the right solution either, but but it's a different direction. So, you know, in the final analysis, deep learning might not survive. Something that does its work will survive, something that can learn from large quantities of data in, you know, efficient and possibly more efficient fashion. Maybe it'll be deep learning, maybe it'll be a sort of more Bayesian thing, um, if people can find ways of scaling those systems. Something like that will survive, that has that spirit. But we needed to learn over more abstract kinds of things. And something like knowledge graphs will survive. We need to be able to represent knowledge like that. But I don't think we have the right synthesis yet. It's great. And uh, part of your answer uh, answered the questions from Matt, uh, or, or also partly was, uh, who says he's happy with your, your talk and says he's been making that point for years and that. Uh, but he's also asking why, you know, when we have Bayesian statistics, uh, they are 100 years old. How come it took so long in order to you know, come to the realization that you know, we need knowledge? There's a lot of politics in machine learning, like a surprising amount. Um, you know, I've been attacked like personally ad hominem for years for arguing that deep learning isn't enough. And, and um, I think you know, people have investments in, in economic investments. They want their graduate students to prosper. They want money for their research and, and things like that. Um, it's been very political on the one hand. On the other hand, I think that there's a strong anti-nativist bias in machine learning. So you have a set of people that um, fundamentally care about learning, and that makes them, I think, ignore often the innate contribution, although I think that's really starting to change. So you know, I gave the example of DeepMind moving from writing papers about mastering Go without human knowledge to incorporating it. But I think the initial work reflected that bias. And you know, I had a debate with Yashua Bengio last year um, that you can find online, and I was pushing innate knowledge and saying, I don't think there's that, that much there. And he actually has an archive paper today laying out a lot of ways of thinking about putting innate, I mean, he might not use that word, but innate knowledge into deep learning. So I think there's been a bias. I think the bias is shifting in the direction that I'm advocating. But it does reflect a deep-seated attachment to learning from people who study learning and maybe aren't always looking at the deep picture, and there's like a, a human nature thing that we think that we learn by imitating our parents and stuff like that, and when it's actually much more complicated than that. But there, my, my colleague, Iris Behrendt uh, at Northeastern University, um, collaborator, I should say, um, has been working on this in the last year or two, documenting that people actually have a bias against innateness. Like, they don't want to believe it. Um, people believe innateness about temperament in children. They understand that if they've Two kids, they have different temperaments, but they really don't want to believe that there's innate knowledge. Even though, like, you look at animals, that, like precocial animals that can just get up and walk around and climb mountains, it's obvious that it is biologically possible to have innate knowledge. But there are many people who just kind of wish that that wasn't so. And I can't fully explain it, but it's, you know, it's a documented part of the innate human biases to be biased against innateness. Those are great insights. Uh, so there's, uh, there's a question from uh, Greg Sharp, and uh, Greg is asking uh, about uh, evaluation. How, uh, how do we have to, to change evaluations uh, of deep learning? And I, I'm you know, uh, augmenting his, his questions to make it more, uh, question more general. How do we have to consider uh, evaluation uh, of, of deep learning uh, in, in that context, right? How, how can we have better you know, data set and benchmarks uh, that would take into account 
uh, these uh, these specificities of having knowledge and um, there's a kind of interesting chicken and egg thing there, which is it's pretty obvious to me what the next task should be, but nobody wants to do it because it's too hard. So I've been arguing for at least five years that w the real assessment would be a comprehension test where you could take in arbitrary input and answer questions about it. So they could be videos, they could be podcasts, they could be written articles. And then you answer questions. There are some technical problems in how to automate that. Um, you need a lot of crowdsourcing to make the task, but it would be a major advance if we had systems that really do um, comprehension and not just like fill in the blanks and stuff like that. Um, but the problem is nobody knows how to, do, how to do it, so people don't work on it. Instead, what happens is people work on the benchmarks that they have some immediate grasp on. And so um, I often have this discussion with Yejin Choi, who I think has done some of the best work on benchmarks in, in the last few years. And she's always trying to find something that's like two steps outside of the reach of the field in order to push the field along. But often people wind up chasing benchmarks. You don't really learn that much from this. And it goes all the way back to the Turing test as the first benchmark in the field. And <coughs> it's actually a lousy test. Why is the Turing test a lousy test? despite its fame. Well, it's a lousy test because you can beat it by cheating. You can beat it by, or maybe cheating is a strong word, but by evading things. So the Turing test is like, do I understand a human conversation? But the, the best competitors on the Turing test pretend to be paranoid, non-native speakers of English, and children. So like Eugene Guzman a few years ago, you quote won a version of the Turing test by doing all that. Pretended to be a 14-year-old boy from, a 13-year-old boy from Odessa. And you'd ask it questions and would avoid the questions. That managed to persuade people that they were talking to a human being, but the system didn't actually know anything about the world. It's actually easy to fool it if you know how you ask questions like, is a watch bigger than a bread box? And it can't answer any of that kind of stuff. Um, but it would fool judges in a short conversation. Well, we learned nothing by fooling judges in a short conversation. And we're not learning a lot from systems like GPT about how to build actual AI systems. It can beat a bunch of benchmarks, but you know, the benchmark of do you really understand a story is, is a hard one that would actually lead us somewhere. But if people can't eke out half a percent each year and, you know, get a journal publication, they don't want to work on it. And so we kind of stuck there. Um, There's a question from, I don't know how to pronounce this name, maybe. Um, Saying, Please you've heard ahead. someone describe deep learning as algorithms that end with scale proportionately with the data given them. And Shane Legg of DeepMind seems to agree that AGI is inevitable. Um, basically, the question is, is scaling alone going to get this there? So the people who have really taken up that charge lately are open AI. They're making bigger and bigger models. And the models are more and more impressive. But the question is, is that actually getting us to artificial general intelligence? And I would argue no. So, you know, GPT-3 is scaled up by a factor of, I think it's 100 compared to GPT-2. I might be forgetting my numbers there. And it's much better at the autocomplete kind of stuff that it did before, kind of producing surrealist stories given segments of it. But it's not really better at reasoning about the world. It's not really better at understanding what grape juice and cranberry juice are, what people are, and so forth. And so there are some things where the scaling has made great progress and other things like really understanding a conversation or really understanding the world where it's made no progress at all. And my view is that scaling is going to make autocomplete better and better, but it's not getting at these deep questions of fundamentally, how do you reason about the physical world and the psychological world so that you can do intelligent things and understand conversations with people? Scaling has not helped there. Great. Uh, another question, uh, maybe the last one, uh, which is, uh, uh, in your opinion, Adding, it's from Marikita, uh, adding uh, knowledge to deep learning, is this the right approach to replicating the linguistic capacity of the human brain in AI? Well, I'll put it this way. Deep learning as it is right now doesn't add linguistic knowledge, it ignores it. Part of why I don't like the open AI approach is it basically ignores contributions of people like Adele Goldberg. There's, a, there's some kind of compatibility in that they're both data-driven. But it's not really representing these kinds of interactions. Um, and it's also ignoring the work of Chomsky and the many different um, flavors that his students have taken that over, over the years. <clears throat> and it's, it's kind of information, it's, it's intellectually 
isolated. It, it, it's the opposite of interdisciplinarity. It's like we don't need linguistics. And the reality is we do need linguistics. And linguists have figured out a lot of subtle things about how meaning and form relate. And, and we want to have a framework that includes those. And right now, deep learning is not that framework. It could become it, maybe, um, depending on how you define deep learning. But the, the sort of multiple layers of a neural network without explicit symbolic knowledge doesn't give you a way to integrate that knowledge. And so there may be a role for deep learning, but maybe we need something new entirely that is less intellectually isolated, more able to synthesize these different traditions. And maybe that's, that's what will really be the big step, big leap in AI.